Truth Espresso, episode 234. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. This is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Hello there, this is your host, Daniel Minnick, and I have with me my sweet, beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea, and we're going to continue in this episode what we said that we were going to continue from the last episode. It seems like the news happens at a million miles an hour right now, and so we were talking about the recent case for the abortion pill that was in the Supreme Court. And we mentioned last episode that it was going to be determined this past week. It was headed to the Supreme Court for them to decide on Wednesday. And so now that Wednesday has come and gone, we have some updates in that case to talk about. And as we had our series dealing with the Colorado abortion, laws, in particular the one dealing with uh, abortion pill reversal, we have updates on that too. And so so we are ready to tackle this abortion pill and abortion pill reversal news items in this episode. Yeah, um, thanks for letting me join you in on these conversations. So it's interesting how we have (laughs) different cases dealing with the availability of the abortion pill being challenged and questioned as well as a state law that's attempting to make the abortion pill reversal illegal and how that's being challenged. So, sweetheart, to start off our discussion on these two cases, you have some verses to share, (laughs) kind of to set the discussion and the mood here. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I was just thinking of these verses from Philippians when reading these different articles, and it seems like there's so much just evilness in a lot of the news that we're hearing almost every single day, and it can sometimes be overwhelming. Sometimes it can be a little more confusing of, okay, what do I believe? What's like true in the news? What isn't? And trying to decipher all that. And for some reason, these verses came to mind when I was reading through the article today. So Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the peace of God shall be with you. So I just love that these verses kind of tell you like what to focus on and to dwell on things that are true, to dwell on things. And when we're looking at these two cases of the abortion pill and also the abortion pill reversal, just thinking, okay, how are these things promoting like virtue? How are these things promoting justice? And how are they showing honesty? And I think that just kind of helps us when looking at these to know what is true. And then for some reason, I love in verse nine, where Paul says, these things that you have learned and received and heard do. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, okay, you don't just like listen and take in this information and like, oh yeah, that was good. (laughs) But he says, do like, we're supposed to do something with this information. And I think the same thing with the information we're going to present today is this is information that we can do something about, whether it's praying, whether it's telling other people in your communities and in your circle of influence about what's going on and just trying to have that unity in the body of Christ that we can 
gathers together in prayer or whether it's um, helping with legislation or, I mean, there's so many different levels that we can do something with this. And so I just like that part of verse too. Oh yeah. It reminds me of, which I didn't put in my notes, but I know it's a James chapter one, though be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. So it kind of reflects on where Paul says the things that you have learned and heard and seen in me do, you know, don't just hear it and witness it, do something with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the God of peace shall be with you. I like that part too. (laughs) And so Philippians 4, 8, where it talks about what things to think on that are virtuous and stuff, things that are of good report. Like, so you're saying that we can't get that from the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, just reading those does that help us reflect on virtue and love things that are lovely and of good report? <laughs> Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just think that this verse is a good reminder that (laughs) those are not the things we should reflect on. (laughs) They're not the source of what things that are lovely and of good rapport and true and honest. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's what the word of God is for. (laughs) Yes. So which case are we going to tackle first? (laughs) Well, let's tackle the one that we talked about from the last episode, which is the one that was at the Supreme Court and that... We mentioned last episode is the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus the FDA. And so as we concluded the episode from last week, we mentioned that first it was the federal district court in Texas that had basically ruled, okay, uh, the FDA illegally approved mifeprestone, the first pill in the abortion pill regimen, and then... That went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which ruled that mifeprestone can stay legal, but the original year 2000 rules would uh, go back into play, so it would be more restricted than it is now. And, of course, the Department of Justice didn't like either of those rulings, and so they went to the Supreme Court and The Supreme Court was scheduled this last Wednesday to make a kind of an order on it. And on Wednesday, they announced that they had to move to Friday to give more time for their order. And on Friday, the Supreme Court decided to stay all the lower court rulings. So basically, all the current rulings are put on hold, which means that there's no change to the status quo, which then means that, okay, so back to the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine will then present their case again in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to get an official hearing. So the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals will begin to hear oral arguments May 17th. So instead of just a a ruling, there will be an actual case there to hear out beyond the case that was in the Federal District Court in Texas. And it's hard to say what's going to happen now. Now, of course, the pro-life side is would be, you know, kind of disappointed with what the Supreme Court did, basically kind of to punt <laughs> the decision back to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And if you try to think about it, they're probably thinking like, okay, it's not our place to make a ruling that affects legal issues without hearing an actual case through our court. So like, I kind of understand why they did what they did, but it's still disappointing. And now, Justice Samuel Lito and Justice Clarence Thomas, the two most conservative in the Supreme Court, did dissent from this uh, particular order. They were the two who dissented, the other ones who are considered conservative, who were like with the Dobbs decision, you know, they didn't dissent. And so they kind of approved of the Supreme Court's order to stay all the rulings and punt things back to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which may means that Mifepristone continues to be widely available by mail up to 10 weeks of pregnancy and so on. 
So do you, you have anything, any comments to make about that, sweetheart? What happened there? Yeah, uh, kind of disappointed there, but trying to understand the thinking of some of these Supreme Court justices. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, when you were just describing this, it reminded me of when Jesus was on trial. <laughs> and how they're like, oh, bring him to Pilate. No, bring him to Caesar. Like, <laughs> no one wanted to actually deal with the situation. They just kept sending him back and forth. And to Herod, too. Uh, yeah, also to Herod, yeah. That was kind of a random <laughs> thought. But um, it's interesting talking with some other Christians about this case, too. A lot of people are kind of frustrated that there were only two conservatives that hmm. dissented or even somewhat tried to make a comment or a statement about this because, um, like, Kavanaugh hmm. was a big part of, and is it oh, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett. Barrett, yeah. yeah. So it was just kind of interesting that there's some just silence on that part of it. But you're right, like, this is something that kind of needs to be discussed more and I think vetted out a little bit more, too, because I'm hoping and I don't know if you read some of the comments from, I'm trying to remember the guy's name that's representing him from Defending Freedom Alliance. Is it Eric Baptist? Yeah, Eric Baptist. So I remember reading one of his comments that this is actually really common for the ruling to go this way mm. and that it's yeah just to bring more information out on all of this and so he actually saw it as like okay this is a normal thing now we can continue to make the case and make it stronger and bring out more evidence and mm. things like that so yeah like there's a way to understand why they did what they did but at the same time still be disappointed because to think about well there's still babies that will end up dying from women taking mifeprestone because it's available and stuff but it's legal strategy there and i do want to comment on disappointments with say brett kavanaugh and amy coney barrett in particular i want to point out amy coney barrett has been somewhat of a disappointment even since her confirmation from my understanding of things because especially when you think about the cases that would come to the supreme court dealing with the jabs she every single time always ruled in favor of enforcing the jabs and you think someone who's like a Catholic who has how many children, you know, including some adopted, like why would she always argue in favor of enforcing jabs on people when the case is to say, this is going to crush us and we can't be forced to inject stuff in our bodies. Obviously, she just somehow thinks, whatever her opinion of it, the public health, that it's somehow compassionate to force someone to take a jab. That was very disappointing for me when I'd see her always on that side. And then it's interesting to me how Justice Brett Kavanaugh seems to get like such heat from the left. Uh, and I think it's just because of the stigma of the fact how he was confirmed that whole scandal there. And with Trump, you know, everyone sees Trump. <laughs> they see Trump's face on him. You know, it's like he should not have been confirmed and somehow Trump gave us Kavanaugh so he's the greatest evil even though he's hardly the most conservative justice but he's the one that militant pro-abortionist guy actually schemed to murder. Despite all that, it is what it is and we'll see if the strategy plays out maybe to make the case stronger to reverse Mifepristone. So it's disappointing as it is, but, you know, we have to just continue to pray for what's going on with this particular case, that God will work his will through this and get truth out there so that the justices who ultimately will rule on this in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we expect if the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has any kind of ruling, at least even similar to what they did before, 
or if there's any restrictions on things than how they are allowed with Mifepristo now, it would ultimately end up going to the Supreme Court, of course. <laughs> and then so we'd have to see how things go there, too. But yes, let more truth come out. So this was one of the articles that I got a little frustrated with and how they were trying to present why this is such an evil attack on women. So the Washington Post, now I know you pointed out to me that this was the opinion part. (laughs) So it was an article marked as opinion, even though some that don't get marked as opinion can often just scream, this is highly opinionated, but... (laughs) Yes, so this article is specifically attacking Alito, and because I guess Alito did write some sort of opinion He wrote the dissent. The dissent, yeah. So this author in the article here is accusing Alito of that he doesn't care, quote, one whit about the women affected if the drug were suddenly made unavailable, unquote. Which to me is interesting because when you are looking at Mifeprostone and why this was even presented as a case... They're saying it wasn't tested properly. Hmm. They're saying it was pushed through quickly, that there have been enough adverse events from it, and that's part of why it was on the REMS database in the first place, and they're trying to pull back on that, and there have been deaths associated with this. So wouldn't you think that the argument would be, okay, these people are concerned about women Hmm. and their health. And that's why they're trying to see, okay, is this a safe medication to even be giving women? But instead, they're saying that this is going to destroy women if they can't get this pill that kills their baby and could potentially kill them. It's so backwards. So that's where I was like, oh, Philippians 4, 8 just makes sense here because trying to decipher what is truth and <laughs> Like, what is the good that's trying to be presented in these cases? And Yeah, obviously, all they think is that it is true, of course, that there's religious reasons, you know, religious being a regard for the sanctity of life, including that of the unborn, why there's a case against Mifepristone, but part of the case and also involves the danger to women, the statistics for it, as you mentioned, so you heart that it wasn't tested and vetted properly. Oh, it was ultimately rushed to approval and pushed that way. The FDA approved it under false pretenses that we can approve it if we classify pregnancy as a serious illness. <laughs> and so the whole idea of pregnancy being a serious illness, well, that seems to be the thought today. And then, so it's like, you don't bat an eye about that reasoning there because allegedly Justice Alito doesn't care one whit about women because abortion is simply the greatest thing in the world, the greatest women's rights, reproductive rights um, thing in the world, and somehow like unexpected pregnancy is the worst possible thing anyone can ever endure. And the only solution to it is to terminate the pregnancy, i.e. kill the unborn child. And there's no thought for the idea that there's alternatives or that there's support available because when we get to the Colorado um, (laughs) case, one of the bills that we talked about had to do with considering pregnancy centers, fake clinics, and that what they advertise to women is really like deceptive practice. So the pro-abortion side really wants to make it as if abortion is the only thing, the only solution to dealing with an unexpected pregnancy, that there's no support or help available that also affirms the life of the unborn child. And so the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals will begin to hear oral arguments back on the case for Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus the FDA. 
would urge you to pray for that situation and for the arguments there and for God to work his will. Andrew Rappaport's Rap Report is a podcast providing biblical interpretations and applications. It is a ministry of striving for eternity and part of the Christian podcast community. We provide a biblical view of cultural events, discuss how to apply God's word to the Christian life, address issues that concern the church, and we even take some time to offer a correct understanding of those commonly misinterpreted passages of scripture. You will hear from great guests like Justin Peters, Todd Friel, Jay Warren Wallace, and Gabe Hughes. Andrew has the Rap Report Daily, which is a two-minute Monday through Friday podcast, and then the longer Rap Report podcast for more content. Subscribe to both today by searching for Rap Report on any podcast app, spelled R-A-P-P Report, or click the podcast link at strivingforeternity.org. And now we move to the other case we want to discuss which is kind of near and dear to our hearts. It has to do with the state in which we reside and deal with one of the bills that was one of the worst bills. All three of them are just ridiculously bad, but this one was one that more directly affects life-affirming medical practice. And that was the bill SB 23190 that tries to make it difficult for crisis pregnancy centers to advertise their services effectively without being accused with an ambiguous law of advertising deceptively. And then also it tries to ban the abortion pill reversal. When we last talked about the bills, they passed the Colorado House, and it took a few weeks, but then Governor Jared Polis signed the three bills Friday evening, April 14th. Now, we figured that there would be challenges to this because it's a very chilling, crushing bill to force crisis pregnancy centers and life-affirming medical practitioners who want to give the abortion pill reversal from having to put up with a law that says you can't do that. They have the conscience that they have to save lives whenever possible. And so within hours of Governor Polis signing this on the Friday evening of April 14th, Bella Health and Wellness, that has three locations in the state of Colorado, filed a lawsuit against the Colorado government that the law, SB 23190, is unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment and their free speech rights and also chills uh, Bella's ability to care for pregnant patients according to their religious convictions by suppressing the abortion pill reversal. So Bella, in their lawsuit, mentioned that they even had a patient that they had just given. They had just started the abortion pill reversal protocol with, I think it was the day or the day before Governor Polis signed the laws. And so it's kind of like, well, we started this. The patient needs it. What are we supposed to do? We can't just stop giving the progesterone. And so they immediately filed this right after the signing. And then Daniel Domenico, who is a Trump-appointed federal district judge in Colorado, issued a temporary restraining order just after midnight Saturday morning to block enforcement of the law for Bella Health and Wellness. So this was a matter of a few hours after the bills were signed that the lawsuit was filed, and then a federal district judge there issued a temporary restraining order to block the law for 14 days. (laughs) Did you read any of the statements that Polis made when signing the bills? Yeah, I did see where when he was signing 190, he expressed kind of his reservation about kind of have something against there's trouble with a bill trying to have legal process of dictating medical policy. But, you know, of course, he still signed it because how could he not, you know? (laughs) But his expression of concern was just for the period of now until the part of the bill that 
in which the health agencies would then not declare the abortion pill reversal a generally accepted practice. So basically, his concern was, well, should we really be making this illegal until September? Because I'm sure he fully expected they're going to come on our side as expected and they'll do it in September, October, later this year. But until then, it's just kind of weird to dictate legally, you know, a medical practice while we're waiting for them to officially agree with us. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of weird there, but yeah. Yes, that's so it's like couldn't he have waited to sign that one until October even yeah I'm sure he could have but I know I'm sure the legislators really wanted him to <laughs> sign this and you have to sign all three they're a package right yeah and I don't know if you saw the picture of him at the signing and the sponsors like kind of surrounding him and yeah like it was like party night there right yeah it was just like oh it made you sick to your stomach to look at that they're just like so excited that he signed these bills and you're like oh wow In their world, it's like, yay, we could finally bring heaven to earth, even though these bills are just like the absolute epitome of evil as far as radical pro-abortion policy is concerned, including Bill 188 that enshrines unlimited gender-affirming care. Yeah, and 189 that makes insurance companies have to fund abortion, all this nonsense. This lawsuit, Bella Health and Wellness versus Colorado, is now, as we record this, the temporary restraining order for 14 days, Monday, as in when this episode airs and goes live. If you're listening to this Monday, when this episode is released, this very same day is scheduled for oral arguments for Judge Domenico to determine whether to expand the temporary stay for Bella and possibly for other practitioners. Now, the other side is kind of trying to throw their own form of temporary stay as a way to avert the whole lawsuit itself, which doesn't make sense. And I know Bella Health and Wellness is not going to accept their argument for this. (laughs) I want to look at an article from the Colorado Sun from April 21st entitled, Colorado regulators, prosecutors won't enforce new state law banning abortion reversal until medical board weighs in. So that's the title of the article. And a quote from the article says, the two boards referring to the Colorado Medical Board and Colorado Board of Nursing, voted unanimously not to enforce Senate Bill 190 until they decide whether abortion pill reversal is a, quote, generally accepted standard of practice, unquote, a determination they're unlikely to make before September, according to court filings. So, unquote from the article there. So, it's a plus right now, to some extent, that the pro-Bill 190 side has decided not to enforce that part of the bill to ban the abortion pill reversal until the medical boards determine, according to the text of the bill, whether or not the abortion pill reversal is considered an acceptable and safe practice. So the bill itself was proposed to make it illegal until they decide that it's legal. Now they decided that, okay, we're not going to enforce that until we decide that it's definitely illegal because the boards there are so pro-abortion, they have no intention of in any way indicating that abortion pill reversal is safe and effective (laughs) and a generally accepted medical practice. So basically what they're saying is we're not going to force this until September or October, whenever they make that decision according to the bill. So I think it's interesting because the bill actually gives a deadline of October. And then this article is saying like it's unlikely that they would even come to a decision by then. So what happens when October comes around and they haven't made a decision yet? Then it's like it is banned, but still kind of not. I don't. They made it so confusing that it's just... 
a poor writing on the sponsor and writer's side of this. So according to the bill, and this was because of an amendment that was approved, this part about the medical boards deciding wasn't in the original text of the bill. It was just going to be an outright ban from signing, but the bill says that by October 1st, that the abortion pill reversal procedure would not be allowed unless three boards in collusion with one another. So all three of them have to get together and all three of them have to agree that abortion pill reversal is acceptable and the deadline for them to do that is October 1st of this year. And that's kind of a not very long and I don't think they are, they're under any pressure to do what they obviously don't care to do because they're all pro-abortion and so why would they do it so it's just basically to give the veneer of medical approval for this bill to ban abortion pill reversal and to you know just okay we will give them time to do what we know they're going to do anyway and not do anything so that it remains illegal and the medical boards haven't approved it so therefore why how can anyone argue with that That's the whole purpose of that text in the bill. Another quote from this article says, Meanwhile, the Colorado Attorney General's Office and the District Attorneys overseeing criminal prosecutions in Denver, Boulder, Arapahoe, Douglas, Lincoln, and Elbert counties said that they too would not enforce, unquote, so they would not enforce the uh, abortion pill reversal ban, So, hey, the executives in Colorado and the medical boards are agreeing not to enforce it as medical policy. So, until the October 1st deadline, no one's going to enforce this. So... Yeah. Now we have another quote from the article later. It says, The Attorney General's office argues that since no one is enforcing Senate Bill 190, the temporary prohibition on the measure being enforced is unnecessary and Bella Health has no standing to sue, unquote. (laughs) So Bella uh, is suing Colorado over this bill because it would chill their ability to exercise their religious convictions, which includes caring for women in need as especially pregnant women take the mifepristone, the abortion pill, and they feel regret and want to reverse it. And Bella knows that they can give progesterone to reverse it. They have the religious conviction as a Catholic organization to do that. Of course, their lawsuit is to say this bill is illegal and it's unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment, both for freedom of speech and Congress shall write no law respecting an establishment of religion and prohibit the free exercise thereof. So therefore, because they have a strong, obvious conviction about preserving life, of course, they have to do this. (laughs) That's just procedure to help women and help their babies. So of course, they're going to sue to get this law overturned. But the attorney general here is basically saying, well, if no one's enforcing it right now until October 1st, then you have no standing to sue. So just drop it. But what seems to me is that they want Bella to drop the lawsuit so that, hey, the law will then start to be enforced in full October 1st, and then they can go after Bella. So (laughs) so we are like, why would Bella just say, Okay, that's fine. No one's enforcing it for a few months, so everything's gravy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not going to go that route. (laughs) And it sounds like the representatives are like, "Um, nope, we're still going to pursue this. And so today, Monday, they're going to hopefully have some good conversations and start looking at the actual evidence that progesterone is safe and it helps women. It helps women who have threatened miscarriages. So yes, if you just really pray for our state today that we can see good come out of this, that we would really appreciate that. So yes, Monday, April 24th, the day this episode's released, 
We shall see what happens as Federal District Judge Domenico hears oral arguments on if the restraining order should be extended and how Bella's attorneys are going to argue there because they're not going to back down on this lawsuit. They're not going to determine to drop the lawsuit if the whole purpose is that they would have to bring up a lawsuit again in September or October of this year. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) So to conclude this episode, have some verses that have to do with lawsuits Mm -hmm. (laughs) and how we should think about law as the Bible prescribes against the way um, the other side seems to think that the law is a weapon against life and liberty. That actually brings up an interesting question. There are quite a few Christians that I've known that think Christians should never file a lawsuit. Well, I don't have it in my notes, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul mentions about situations where you shouldn't bring lawsuits, but that's against other saints for petty issues, which um, the Corinthians were doing basically like, hey, you stole my pencil. I'm going to take you to court before the heathens. And Paul's basically like, look, you shouldn't be bringing each other to court as saints. That's not a good testimony. And it appears that what you're doing it for are petty things, like why not just allow yourselves to be defrauded? But we're dealing with the issue of life and liberty, how God has prescribed the laws should be. We should take a stand and Christians should be willing to bring lawsuits to protect people from murder and theft and anything like the laws of general equity as we see in the second table the law would be violated so that is we need to stand up for a rights, just as the authors of the constitution stood up for the rights of people to write into the bill of rights yes thank you for clarifying <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Proverbs 13, 14 says, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. And so I think that, yeah, as Christians, when we think about the way law should be, it should be to protect life and not be a snare of death. So if you're wise, the law of wise is a fountain of life to avoid the snares of death. And so when you have the evil of the legislators in Colorado who wanted a law to prevent life, such as uh, to ban abortion pill reversal and to chill the speech of crisis pregnancy centers to help women choose life, that demonstrates from this verse that they're not wise. (laughs) And now Exodus 23 verses 1 through 2 this is a prescription for how the israelites should handle case law and it says thou shalt not raise a false report put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment or to wrestle against judgment. So we see a lot of (laughs) the things that these verses talk against happening now. People are definitely raising false reports like, we want a particular outcome. It doesn't matter if you have to lie to get your way, even if we know that we're speaking falsehoods here, ignoring truth, you know, we want this outcome. Joining hands with wicked people have unrighteous witness. <coughs> Mitchell Crane and <coughs> <laughs> Dr. Crane, and you know, I would classify him as an unrighteous witness who in the House and Senate floors for SB 190. And verse 2, when it says, you don't follow a multitude to do evil, we definitely see a multitude doing evil with the cases to try to support abortion pills and ban abortion pill reversal. Yes, speaking in a cause to decline after many to wrestle judgment, basically to try to force true righteous justice from happening. 
Yes, definitely see a lot of that in these cases here. Yeah, those are great verses to bring up. And it's like, wow, I just thought of all these different news articles and things that we've been seeing apply to a lot of these different points in that verse. It's amazing to see how, okay, scripture was written thousands of years ago, and yet we still see how applicable it is today like, and how good it is to look at God's word and look at what he says we should do, what we shouldn't do. And that gives us true direction. That gives us that foundation of how we should live and how we should stand up for life. There's just so much in God's word that it's just so important that we keep going back to his word and looking at what his truths are and they apply today. Hmm. Like even though it's thousands of years later, they still apply today. And yes, so God's word is just invaluable. (laughs) (laughs) And timeless. yes. Yes. And so, yes, courts would do well. The legal processes would do well to heed the word of God and how it promotes life and liberty and equality. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. The law is the law. And we see the legal process being more and more weaponized today for an evil agenda. And without allowing things to be impartial, and to hear people out and let the truth stand for itself. So definitely pray for both of these cases as the abortion pill goes back down to a lower court for more decision, while abortion pill reversal goes up to a federal district court for decision there. And stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso, and God bless. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso. 